I've been asked to address the question, can straight writers ever write convincing queer characters? Um, seems to me a really interesting question. Um, and I immediately came up with the answer, yes. And then almost as immediately I came up with the answer, no. So I'm going to try and um, pick my way somewhere between those two answers. I think the question was asked because um, Russell T. Davis, the um, gay television uh, scriptwriter, um, had been talking around the production of It's a Sin, which was screened recently, and was saying that he very much preferred having LGBT actors playing LGBT roles. And indeed, for It's a Sin, he had not only LGBT actors, but also an LGBT crew. And he was arguing that this was the ideal way of uh, presenting material about uh, queer people. Now, as it happens, I didn't like It's a Sin, and I thought that, um, unusually with Davis's work, I thought it was rather badly written and I thought it was rather badly acted, um, but that's a side issue. Um, I, I, except insofar as from my own point of view, I didn't feel that having LGBT actors really did the program any great favors. So coming back to the question, can straight writers ever write convincing queer characters? First of all, the question assumes we know and want to know the sexuality of a book's author. It's much more likely to be available nowadays online, for instance. One, one can always or, or generally find out uh, the sexuality of an author. Um, before about 20 years ago, this was not really often possible. And looking back even further, do I care whether, to go back a long way, Shakespeare was gay. No, not really. Um, only that his sonnets are one of the greatest same-sex poem, love poems ever written. Whatever Shakespeare himself was. The same with Lord Tennyson in the 19th century. He wrote a long poem called In Memoriam, which was an elegy on uh, a very close friend of his, Arthur Hallam. And it's a long, long poem of mourning in which he, uh, Lord Tennyson describes himself as a widow. Um, and I really don't think that Tennyson was gay, but his poem is one of the great gay love elegies. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I really don't particularly care what uh, he did between the sheets, if that's part of the question. Must I know beforehand that an author is gay before I appreciate that author's gay texts? I don't know. Now, a good actor can act anything and a bad actor can't. The same goes for writers. A good writer can act, can write anything, and should be able to write any kind of character. A bad writer probably can't. So if we think back to the 19th century again, one of my favorite authors, Honoré de Balzac, the French novelist, created a man who was one of the great uh, queer characters of all time in fiction. A character who has a number of different names, Jacques Collin, Vautrin, Herrera. And he's in a, a number of Balzac's different novels, Lost Illusions, A Harlot High and Low, Le Père Goriot. Um, now, Vautrin, this character, it's a terrible man, he's a murderer, he's a, a violent criminal, 
so he's not a particularly um, <laughs> positive image of gayness. Um, but he also ends up being a, a senior police officer in the uh, equivalent of, of the French equivalent of Scotland Yard. Not only is he one of the great gay characters, he's one of the great fictional characters of the 19th century. When he's in prison, he has what is apparently a lover. Um, when he's out of prison, he's constantly picking up beautiful young men who he takes on as his protégés and turns into gentlemen or turns into rich men. He becomes their benefactor. Balzac was not gay. Balzac was straight, but he produces this magnificent character. In the 20th century, there's a novel by David Storey called Radcliffe from 1963, one of my favorite novels. Seems to me one of the great no English novels of a male-male sexual relationship. David Storey was straight. One of the characters is apparently straight and one of them gay. And they have this very, very passionate, sometimes violent uh, relationship that again seems to me tremendous and intense and beautiful and horrific. Um, but, uh, you know, a wonderful piece of straight authored representation of male love. There's a novel by Anthony Burgess, who was straight, a great novel called Earthly Powers from 1980, which is based on the life of the gay author Somerset Maugham. So it is possible for straight writers to produce really very interesting representations of men who love other men. If we think about this thing of writing about people of a different sort from oneself, as I suggested at the beginning, this should be possible for a good writer. But it's always going to be easier, given imbalances of power in society and imbalances of representation, it's always going to be easier, for instance, for a black author to write well about white people than vice versa. It's always going to be easier for a gay person to write about straight characters than vice versa because the group with more power is more visible in society. We know more, we see more representations of white people and of straight people in society, on television and so on. Uh, and so it's always going to be easier for the members of the subordinate group who are writers to write about members of the more powerful group. It's going to be easier for them to write about people of a different sort. So the American gay novelist, James Baldwin, writing mainly in the 1960s, could write, he, uh, he was gay, he was black. He could write about white gay men in his great novels, Giovanni's Room and Another Country. But it's very hard to imagine a white novelist of the period doing the same with black gay men. It may be that it's easier for members of one subordinate group to write sensitively about members of another subordinate group. So for instance, there have been a lot of women writers who have written very good books about gay men. And in particular, there have been very good lesbian or bisexual women novelists who wrote about gay men. There's a whole long list of them from the mid 20th century. Carson McCullers, Iris Murdoch, Marguerite Yourcena, Mary Renault, Patricia Nell Warren. They're very good because as women who are lesbian or who have had lesbian relationships, they can see gayness up close. 
They know it already from their own experience as women who love women. So they're able to write, to identify in some way with men who love men. But equally useful is the fact that they are not male. They see masculinity itself from a skeptical distance. So they can write about these man-loving men who are not living up to the great sort of uh, the great ideal of masculinity, which is heterosexuality. So you have this interesting uh, situation where these lesbian women writers identify with gay men through their own similarity, but dis are distanced from them through uh, gender. And what I'm saying here is that while being similar to your characters can be very useful, so too can distance and difference. Incidentally, I can't think of equivalent male gay books about lesbian women. And there again, that's probably because gay men have more power in society than lesbian women have. And frankly, uh, you know, the interest isn't as much there as the other way around. In the late 20th century, gay writers started to move from what had been a judgmental way of writing about homosexuality. They them, that sort, those people. Gay writers started moving to a much more affirmative tone, a much more positive tone, and talking not about they, them, but we, us. So there was a kind of general uh, coming out among novelists and uh, an openness about being a gay writer writing about gay characters. I think, for instance, of the Violet Quill group in New, New York City uh, in the early 1980s, who decided to do just that. They decided they were going to be out gay writers, they were going to write about gay relationships, and they were going to write for gay readers. And Gay people were going to be we, not they. So you have writers like Edmund White and Andrew Holleran. Edmund White wrote a great trilogy of, of novels, A Boy's Own Story, The Beautiful Room is Empty, The Farewell Symphony. Andrew Holleran similarly wrote a, a really good um, trilogy of books, Dancer from the Dance, Nights in Aruba, the beauty of men. And similarly, across the other side of the country, Armistead Maupin started writing his Tales of the City from 1978 onwards. These were authors who decided to write from within gayness. So here um, we have people who were arguing that a gay writer is going to be better at representing gay characters than a straight one. That's what they fervently believed, that they would do a better job than any straight writers had been doing. And I think this became particularly important in the 1980s when the AIDS epidemic uh, arose and uh, there was such general hostility from politicians and the press and as a consequence from the general public um, that it became very very important for people within the gay community to start writing about AIDS, people affected by AIDS, people who had AIDS, people who had lost friends or lovers with AIDS, again to talk about us, not them, not those filthy AIDS carriers, but us, we are victims of a random epidemic. 
So again, you have this, this, this sense that it was always going to be better to write about AIDS from within the epidemic than from outside it. And at that moment, the community most affected was the gay male community um, and the lesbian community that rallied around to support them. So by this standard, what we call gay literature was literature by and for gay men. Lesbian literature was literature by and for lesbian women. In my own career, I started to adopt the same approach in my literary criticism. I started to write about we and not they. Um, when my history of gay literature came out in 1998, um, a number of straight critics complained about this approach, complained that I was uh, talking about gay men as we, uh, presumably because by doing so, I couldn't be objective about a topic that actually I was one of the world's experts on. So be it. But when we look at literature that we call gay literature, written by gay men, written by lesbians, do we expect them to idealize us, presenting us as being, what, uncommonly nice, well-adjusted, virtuous, when all the old negative books had been about people who were ill-adjusted, who were mad and vicious and sinful, do we still expect gay representations to idealize us? I remember reading so many mid-range gay male novelists whose books were really just going through the motions of offering supposedly positive representations of us. I can think of so many American novels in which the gay central character is good looking. He knows how to cook. He's got good taste. He's well dressed. He's got a nice haircut. He loves Broadway musicals. Uh, <laughs> this kind of complacent tedium out of which this kind of character emerges that gay writers kept serving up for each other's entertainment. Is this idealizing really authentic? I mean, if we think back to Edmund White and Andrew Holleran, they were very careful to portray gay, me gay men as being flawed in lots of ways, uh, but it wasn't their homosexuality that was the flaw. They, they just had all the, the usual portfolio of human flaws um, that made them unlike this, this terrible uh, idealized stereotype that uh, weaker novelists kept uh, churning out. So do we expect gay representations to be normative based on gays we know? Do we want them to be ideal or do we want them to be like us, frail? <laughs> I think what I'm asking here is, why shouldn't the more interesting representations come from writers who know us less, actually? Writers to whom we're not only queer, but actually strange. See, I'm veering back towards the idea that a non-gay writer might actually see us more interestingly sometimes. Well, Maybe I don't go wholeheartedly for that. But let's just think of a, a small handful of recent examples. There's a novel by a woman called Hanya Yanagihara, American woman. Great big thick doorstop of novel called A Little Life from, 19, from 2015. It was criticized by Daniel Mendelssohn in the New York Review of Books uh, for being a novel by a straight author who was presuming to write about gay men. 
it's actually a terrifically powerful book very very good in lots of ways but on the other hand i did find it voyeuristic i did find its way of looking in at gay men very very intimately at gay men's bodies and emotions i did find it especially in its detailed interest in a gay man's physical pain and in his illness rather voyeuristic and and discomforting but then maybe that's what good fiction should do it maybe it should make you shudder somewhat there are a couple of other novels or a couple of other texts there's a novel by andre achiman called call me by my name and a short story by annie prue called brokeback mountain you may recognize the titles they were both um, filmed uh, recently, Brokeback Mountain, Call Me By My Name. In both of those, there's an initial sexual event that I don't think could possibly have been written by a gay writer. Annie Pru is a straight woman, Andre Acherman is a straight man. Um, I won't go into the details, but I think both of the, the key sexual events in those fictions are extremely implausible and uh, make the whole characterization fall apart. So again, I'm coming back towards the, the idea that, um, that a gay man is going to be better at writing a gay character and a lesbian woman is going to be writing, better at writing a lesbian character than a straight person might be. You can see I'm completely undecided about this and wavering towards the position that I started with, which is that a good writer is going to be good anyway. Let me just fiddle my way towards a conclusion. What is LGBT literature? Is it literature about same-sex relationships? If it is, it should then include homophobic texts. Is LGBT literature literature about anything but by LGBT writers? Is it literature by anyone about anything that is read by LGBT readers? Um, there are all kinds of layers within layers. Do we need a gay writer? Do we need a gay reader? In 1985, a lesbian critic called Bonnie Zimmerman wrote, if a text lends itself to a lesbian reading, then no amount of, bibli of biographical proof ought to be necessary to establish it as a lesbian text. And I've tended to stick with that idea that uh, a lesbian text or a gay text is one that is open to a lesbian reading or a gay reading. And I've spent much of my career really enjoying uh, reading pre-20th century texts as lesbian texts and as gay texts because they are open to that reading, plausibly open to that reading. It may be that what matters most is not the gay writer, but the gay reader. Not lesbian writing, but lesbian reading. It seems to me that a reaction against a book is just as important as one in its favor. We can always perform good readings of bad gay books and still learn from them. So in a sense, I'm ending on this occasion with the idea that it really doesn't matter who the author is and it doesn't matter how good the book is, as long as we ourselves bring to the book an interesting reading from our own subjectivity as LGBT readers. Thank you for listening.